Hey everybody, Andrew here from the Glazer Tutoring Company and today I would like to teach you how to use the rational zero theorem to find the real zeros of this particular polynomial function. Now in order to use the rational zero theorem, we kind of have to know what it says. And basically it's this. What you're going to do is you're going to locate your constant term. That's the value without a variable. Then you're going to list out the factors of that constant term. And you're going to call those factors P. You don't have to call them P, but that's basically what they do. Then you're going to identify the leading coefficient, which is the coefficient in front of the highest power of X. And you're going to list out those factors. And you're, going to, and you're going to call them Q. Now you don't have to call them Q, but that's what they do. Then you're going to take the factors P, divide them by the factors Q, and this division then will result in the list of possible real zeros for your function. Kind of cool. Now, basically, let's do it. Let's list out the factors of 1. That's easy. It's just 1, right? 1, positive 1, and negative 1. Because positive 1 times a positive 1 would have given you a positive 1, and a negative 1 times a negative 1 would have given you also a positive 1, right? So plus minus 1. And then for the denominator, you have to list the factors of 2, which would be just 1 and 2, right? So you got a positive minus 1 and a positive and negative 2. So this is nice compared to some of the other problems we were doing because this is actually kind of legitimate, like we can actually kind of use this now since we don't have, you know, 500 possibilities. So what, the, what, we, what I would now do is I would list out my possibilities over here. Okay, my possible real zeros, real zeros. Now, all you do is you take this numerator and divide it by this denominator. You're just thinking about, you know, how many combinations can I make? So you do that division. So positive and negative one divided by positive and negative one would result in a value of just positive and negative one. Okay, so maybe I'll leave this out like this, plus minus one. Then you do the same thing for that combination, positive and negative one. Where's the negative? I don't know. There it is. Divided by then positive and negative two, that's going to result in a value of positive and negative one half. So here are your possibilities now. Okay. Plus minus one, plus minus two. Now I know there's two values there, like of, you know, numbers that you see one and one half, but you really have four values because each of them are plus minus. So you really have positive one, negative one, positive one half, and negative one half. Now this is nice. Okay. And the other problems we have like, you know, 70 different possibilities. And it's like, that's, you're not going to use this theorem to kind of test this out. It's, it's just, it's unreasonable, but this one's actually reasonable to do. So what you're going to do now is this is the list of possible rational zeros. And by the way, since you're dealing with a cubic function, you can have at most three real zeros. So what you do now is if this is the list of possible real zeros. I'm not saying they're all going to work, but how you figure out whether any one of these are going to work, hopefully three of them will, is you're literally going to take one of the values and you're going to plug it in for X. And you're going to see if that results in a zero. That's what it means to be a zero of a function. This value is considered a zero of this function if when it's plugged in for X, it gives a zero. So let's test it. Just plug in the positive one everywhere you see X. And now evaluate. This is just going to work out to be two. This is going to work out to be three. Minus one. Do to do, do minus one plus one. Eh, it doesn't look too promising, right? These annihilate one another. And then this does not equal zero. So this does not equal zero. And what that tells me then is that this right down here is not a zero value. Okay, fine. Well, bad guess at the start, right? Hopefully the other three work. So let's test it. Now, in other problems, I've used the graph to help us out. But this time, I'm actually going to do all the possibilities because it's really not that bad. All right. So let's see what happens now. So when you cube a uh, a negative value, it stays negative, right? So that's going to work out to be overall negative two. When you square a negative, it works out to be positive. So that's going to work out to be negative, well, minus three, positive three. 
Okay, then a minus one and a plus one. So does this work? Well, this doesn't really work either, right? Because this annihilates one another and this definitely doesn't add to zero. Huh, so I guess we're not gonna have three real zeros, this means, okay? So that doesn't work. So this is also not a zero, not a real zero, right? So then what number are you gonna test next? Test the positive one half. Okay, so just go in here. Let's just erase these values. Oh, wait, did I screw that up? This should have been, well, it probably wouldn't have changed anything, but I did, I did not make this negative, I realized. I didn't make, it should have been in here negative, but that wouldn't have changed anything, right? Because this still would have been, let me just double check myself, okay? Because So this would have been then uh, negative two, that would have been a positive, so that's minus three. This would have been a plus one, plus one. Again, it still doesn't work, all right? So sorry about that little mistake, uh, but it, it doesn't work anyway. So, thank goodness. Yeah, so now what we're going to do, yeah, see, everybody makes mistakes. you got to try to catch them, and it depends on what you do about the mistakes when you find out about it. If you just try to brush it under the rug, mm -mm -mm -mm, not a good thing. So then plug in the positive one half everywhere, okay? And let's see what's going to happen now. So this, this just use the calculator, make your life a little easier. So one half, put it in parentheses, and then cube it, okay? And then do minus, minus then three times one half squared, okay? And then do minus, then in parentheses, one half. And then do plus one. Oh, that worked out to be zero. Great. Now what that means is that this is a zero, is a zero. So bada bing, bada boom, we found one. So x should be equal to positive one half. And we'll see that we should expect the function to cross the x-axis at positive one half. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing and test out my negative one half, okay? So just make each of these values now negative. And what you can do to save yourself a little bit of time, go up, highlight that equation, hit enter. It now enters it for you. And then all you have to do is insert some negative values, okay? So you're going to go here, click on the one, you're going to hit second insert or second delete, and it shifts, it'll shift whatever you put in, well, whatever you write in now, which I'm going to write a negative sign, it goes right where that is and it shifts everything as you can see to the right. So that's good. Then you're going to go over here. I want to plug in my a negative sign right there. So I'm going to go to second insert and I'm going to do negative boom, right? Shifted everything. And then I'm going to go over here. Same thing, insert, boom. And that's it. Okay, hit enter. Oh man, it doesn't work out to be zero. So what that means is that this is also not a real zero. What the heck? That's also not a real zero. Okay, so it looks like there's only one real zero of this function. Now, at this particular stage, what we know for certain is that we know we have one real zero at positive one half, right? Also, we know that there's a rational zero at positive one half. What we don't know is if there are some irrational zeros as well. Now, what you can do is you can graph this thing to kind of gain some insight. Uh, but if you don't have a calculator now, what you would do, because by the way, there there's three zeros, whether they're all real, all imaginary, you know, real, rational, that all depends on how the math works out. But I know that I have at least one rational um, and real uh, zero here. So what I would now do if you don't have the calculator, is I would then do a synthetic division, okay? I would then do a synthetic division. So let's erase all this, all right? And what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to divide this polynomial function by my factor, okay, of that zero, which would be x minus then one half. All right, this is the division I'm gonna be doing. Now to do this, we'll do synthetic division. So let's grab a table, take a look. Bam. So what goes in the top row here are going to be the coefficients of your uh, polynomial function in the numerator. So the coefficient of x cubed, coefficient of x squared, coefficient of x, and the constant. So the coefficient of x cubed is a 2, coefficient of the x squared is a negative 3, coefficient of the x is a negative 1, and the constant is a positive 1. All right, great. Then what you're going to do is you're now going to then, uh, if this were the problem, what you would do is set this equal to 0 so you can find the 0 value, meaning x would then be equal to positive 1 half. You already have that though, right? So that's really the number that goes on the outside, okay? 
Now, all you're going to do is follow the simple series of steps. Take this first number, drop it all the way down. Then you take this bottom number, multiply it by that value. So half of two is obviously a one. So plug that in. Then you add that column together. So that's going to be a negative two. Then take the negative two, multiply it by a positive one half. That's obviously going to be a negative one. Plug it into that column. That's going to be a negative two. Then take the negative two, multiply it by the no, positive one half, that's going to be a negative one, add that column together, and you get a value of zero. Now that's what we should anticipate. When the remainder is zero, all right, then uh, this factor here is going to be a factor of this polynomial. And if this is a factor, then we can always find the zero. All right. Now what these coefficients and constant terms represent is that this is going to represent the constant term of your uh, remaining quotient. And this is the coefficient of the x term, that's the coefficient of the x squared term. So the resulting polynomial, when you do, let me just erase some of this stuff now. When you do this, what, what's going on? When you do this division, okay, the resulting polynomial is going to be 2x squared. So we'll do 2x squared. Let me, let me put it over here. 2x squared minus 2x minus 2. Okay? Now, what we can now do from here is that we, since we have a quadratic now, is we can try and factor this. Okay, we can try to factor this if possible, but this, this looks a little messy, right? It's not gonna work out too well. Um, instead, then we can use the quadratic formula on it. Remember the quadratic form x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four ac, all over then two a. All right, so you'd have to identify your a, b's, and c's, and then just a, b, c, d. No, not like that. But you have to identify the a, b, and c values according to this quadratic equation. Remember, the a is the coefficient of the x squared, the b is the coefficient of the x, and the c is the constant. So the a value is a 2, the b value is a negative 2, and the c value is a negative 2. So let's plug that all in. So b, it's negative b, so it's a b was negative 2, plus or minus the square root of negative 2 squared, minus four times your a value of two minus your c, uh, times your c value of negative two, then all divided by then two times the a value, which was two. So when we evaluate this now, this is a positive, right? Positive two plus or minus now. This would become a four, two squared is a four. And then this whole thing would work out to be positive, right? And uh, that's gonna work out to be two times two is a four, and then times a four is a 16. Okay, that's great. And then divide that now by four. Okay, cool. So now, uh, so now what, what I would, well, I guess, yeah, what I would do from here, let's combine the four and the 16, cause that's a 20, right? 20. And then I'm going to try to simplify this radical a little bit. Remember 20 can now be broken up into five times four. And the reason why I'm breaking it up that way is because I realized then that this is really radical five times radical four, right? So now I can really change that up a little bit. So there's going to be radical five, or it doesn't matter which order you plug it in, radical four times radical five, right? You can kind of quote unquote distribute that radical to each term there. And I notice that this is a perfect square, right? Radical four. So that's why I did it because I can pull out that two basically. All right. Now, both of this, this is now plus and minus. So what that means now, actually, why don't we simplify before we even do that? Notice how you have a two here, two here, and four here. So you can reduce this all down by two, right? If you reduce everything down by a factor of two, then it just becomes a one, a one, but you don't need to write the one there, and a two. So it works out to be this. So in other words, your other two values here are going to be one plus radical five all over two and one minus radical five all over two. So these are now going to be the, all three of these are now going to be the zeros of the function. These are irrational because the square root of five is irrational, right? I mean, if you look at it, square root five, that looks pretty irrational to me, right? So that's how you would now find all the factors. You have to do the quadratic equation here. You have to go about it this way. That rational zero theorem will only tell you the rational, you know, real zeros here. Um, it won't tell you if they're imaginary, and it won't also tell you if something is irrational. So you got to be careful when you apply that, uh, you know, when you apply that method. Now, what you can do to check yourself is you can use the program I have here. Take a look in the description below. I'll leave you a link. It's like a three-minute video. Watch how nice this is when you uh, execute this uh, quadratic program. So you plug in your A value. We said the A was a negative 2. 
Oh, no, excuse me. A was 2, sorry. Uh, the B was going to be a negative 2, and the C was a negative 2. And you hit enter. Now, this gives it to you in decimal form, right? But why don't we just take a quick screenshot so we can see those values and watch what I'm now going to do. I'm going to evaluate my answers that I have uh, over, over here. I'm going to evaluate these answers. So let's do one. Actually, I probably didn't even need to bring it on the screen. But one plus then radical five. Okay, and then divide that bad boy by two. And I realize, oh, look, 1.618. That's exactly what that is there. And I didn't even need this over here. Um, but as you can see now, um, I I'm pretty good. You know what I mean? I, I know I'm not even going to bother checking this other one because I know I'm right. Once I, once I get one of the values, the other one's definitely going to be fine. Um, so, yeah. So as you can see, uh, you know, uh, and then, you know, if you wanted, you could also graph this thing just to kind of show. All right, I'll bring the screenshot back out. I'll bring the screenshot back out. And what we'll do is we're going to graph this original function that we had. So we're going to do 2x cubed, 2x to the third, minus 3x squared, minus x, and then plus a 1. And let's graph it. Now, if you notice here, let's bring that onto the screen. No, this looks a little messy, but if you notice our positive one half up here, okay, is right here. That's one of the zeros. Our negative 0 0.6, right? That, that That's reason. I mean, this looks like negative 0 0.6, right? And then our 1.6, this does look like 1.6. It doesn't look like 1.5. It looks a little greater, right? So that's the whole idea. That's how we found all the zeros, all right? And that's where the function crosses the x-axis on a graph, you know, visually. That's That's what it does. So I don't know about you, but I'm falling asleep a little bit. So um, yeah, I'm going to go take a nap after this one. Guys, thanks for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. Please help us out by subscribing and liking. Maybe even tell some of your classmates. We love to help more people. And we have thousands of videos out there, not only in mathematics, but chemistry and physics as well. we got thousands of solved solutions. All right. And we use the OpenStax textbooks. It's great. So go take a look. You can download those books for free. And then you have solved solutions for all the problems in the books for free with our channel. We also provide one-on-one -on -one tutoring as well if you'd like to continue your education with us privately. Love to help you. Take care.